Everybody knows about the great city-states of Athens and Sparta and how they dominated the ancient Greek world. However, at the very epicentre of the Greek world, indeed in the very centre of the ancient Greek world, was the city-state of Corinth. Now, Corinth had a very long history and was often at the centre of major events in the ancient Greek world. So, what is the history of Corinth and how did it become such an important city? Welcome to the history of the city of Corinth. Now, the earliest known inhabitation of the Corinthian area was in the Neolithic times, specifically in 5000 BC when the earliest Neolithic finds were found in the Corinthian area. By 750 BC, the Brachidae had taken power in the town of Corinth. Now, the Brachidae were a Doric clan that brought Corinth out of the backwater of ancient Greece. Now, the city before this had really not been an important site, indeed it had been kind of overshadowed by Argos, Sparta and Athens. Now, Corinth began to assert itself overseas, specifically by founding colonies. In 733 BC, Corinth founded Syracuse, which would go on to be one of the most important Greek cities in the ancient world, dominating mainland Sicily. In the same year, Corinth also founded the city of Corsera. Now, Corinth was able to expand their sphere of influence over the Mediterranean quickly because in 700 BC, Corinth adapted the trireme from the Phoenicians. Indeed, this was only a small portion of what the Greeks borrowed from the Phoenicians, as they also borrowed their alphabet, enabling Greece to come out of their Dark Ages and thus begin the Classical Age of Ancient Greece. Corinth was able to use the trireme to assert itself as a naval power in Ancient Greece. However, Corinthian naval dominance would almost immediately come under threat, as their own colony, Corsera, defeated them in a naval battle. Indeed, only a few years after this, the Brachidae were expelled from the city and were replaced by a series of tyrants. These tyrants weren't tyrants as we know it, indeed many Greek tyrants needed the support of the people to maintain their power and as a result often treated the people quite luxuriously. However, they still obtained power through undemocratic means. So these tyrants would be in power from 657 BC to 585 BC. Now, what's noteworthy is during this time, the famous black figure pottery was invented in Corinth. So this pottery grew to be extremely popular in Corinth and eventually grew to be extremely popular in mainland Greece. The popularity of this pottery is evidenced by the fact that this is the main known form of art from the ancient Greek world besides their statues. However, the city of Corinth's contribution to ancient Greek culture didn't just end with pottery. Indeed, the most famous helmet of ancient Greece, the Corinthian helmet, funnily enough comes from Corinth, in case you couldn't tell from its name, and not from the city of Sparta as many people believe. The Spartans in fact wore very simple helmets, which were little more than metal bowls placed on their head. So the Corinthian helmet for a time would be one of the more popular helmet designs in ancient Greece. Putting aside the Corinthians' impact on how we view ancient Greece, the tyrants who were ruling Corinth at the time were eventually kicked out in 585 BC and were replaced by a oligarchy of 80. A few years later, the Peloponnesian League was established led by Sparta. The Peloponnese was the area in which both Corinth and Sparta controlled in ancient Greece. Now, as Sparta was the head of the Peloponnesian League, it brought its allies into a war with Athens, who they believed threatened Greek freedom due to the fact that they were beginning to form their own empire. So Corinth joined Sparta in the war against Athens. 
Recognising that they had a potential ally in Athens, Corsera allied with the Athenians and went to war with their mother city once again. So Corinth assembled their navy and in another naval battle Corsera defeated the Corinthians and as a result the Athenians managed to campaign in the Corinthian Gulf to great success. Not much else really happened between the Corinthians and the Athenians, however the two sides continued to effectively be at war, especially seeing they both wanted naval dominance in the Greek world. So in the time between 421 and 416 BC, Athens and Corinth were essentially in what was the ancient equivalent of a cold war, with both sides neither directly attacking the other one but at the same time not signing any sort of peace treaty and acting friendly towards them. However, the status quo that was being established with Sparta as the dominant land power and Athens as the dominant naval power would not be certain as in a few years time the entire Greek world as they knew it would be turned on its head, with Corinth playing a pivotal role in the many centuries to come. By the end of the Peloponnesian War, the city of Corinth had established itself as both a naval power and as a dominant city in mainland Greece. However, things were beginning to change in the Greek world and the previous warring years would pale in comparison to the bloodshed that was about to be spilt. So following the long and bloody Peloponnesian War, Sparta had asserted itself as the main land power on ancient Greek soil. Now this began to present a whole series of problems as the ancient Greeks like their freedom and they like to make a big fuss of their freedom. So in 395 BC the Thebans and the Athenians as well as the Argives decided to rise up against Spartan hegemony in ancient Greece. Joining them, surprisingly, was Sparta's long-term ally and member of the Peloponnesian League, the city of Corinth. Now, these allies were backed by a unlikely source of income, specifically the Persian Empire. Now, a few decades prior, the Persians had attempted to invade mainland Greece and had been soundly defeated by both the Athenians and Spartans at multiple engagements, such as the Battle of Marathon between the Athenians and the Persians and Thermopylae and Plataea between the Spartans and Persians. So now greatly humbled by the fact that they had been defeated by such a small collection of city-states, the Persian kings now meddled in Greek affairs, hoping to keep them in check by turning them against each other. As such, the Persians supplied the allies with a large quantity of gold, which they used to fund their war efforts. Now, to begin with, the war began quite well for the allies as they had this unlimited resource of money from the Persians. So the Spartans look at this and decide the best way to defeat this alliance would be to get the Persians to turn sides. And eventually in 386 BC, Sparta succeeds and uses the funds received from Persia to fund their own war effort. This eventually results in Sparta winning the war. This war would become known as the Corinthian War and would see Sparta victorious However, the Spartan power was so diminished that they were eventually ousted by the Thebans for the hegemonic title of the leader of the Greek city-states. So as you can see, the Greeks again immediately began to turn on each other, each vying for control over the Greek world. Now nothing quite unites the Greeks like a foreign invader, and this foreign invader would be Philip of Macedon. Now, Philip viewed himself as a Greek. He had, after all, grew up in the city of Thebes as a political hostage. 
So when Macedon was being viewed as a backwater and barbarous tribe by the Greeks, it made Philip very angry because he thought his people were more than equal to the Greeks. So after a period of Greekifying the Macedonian kingdom, as well as carrying out various military reforms, Philip eventually invaded classical Greece. And this united the cities of Thebes, Athens and Corinth to essentially repel the invasion. This didn't exactly go to plan as Philip and his son Alexander defeated both Corinth, Thebes and Athens at the Battle of Chironia, thus securing Macedonian hegemony over the Greek world. So what Philip does after this is he establishes a league of Greek city-states. Now this league was stationed in the city of Corinth and became known as the League of Corinth. So the purpose of this league was to unite Greece against a common enemy which was the Persian Empire, as the Greeks had still not forgotten how the Persians had invaded mainland Greece all those decades earlier. Now Philip had already sent a small army into Asia Minor to secure a beachhead for the Greek Macedonian army that was to follow. However, he would be assassinated and his young son Alexander would take up the throne and he eventually led the Greeks and Macedonians to basically the end of their known world. He took them as far as India. So during this time, Alexander left a regent to essentially keep the Greeks in check. This regent was called Antipa. Now, Antipa would later play a very pivotal role when Alexander died. He eventually managed to become regent of the entire Macedonian Empire, only to die himself afterwards. Now, Antipa had a son. This son was called Cassander. Cassander, in lack of better words, can be described as a right nasty piece of work and he eventually became the governor of his father's former power base of Macedon and Greece. During this time, Cassander managed to murder the entirety of Alexander's family, which eventually allowed him to assume the kingship. During his kingship, he continued to murder and plot his way to various other schemes, and he somehow died of natural causes. How he wasn't assassinated is honestly beyond belief. So following his death, Greece and Macedon came under the rule of the Antigonids. And Corinth would become a essential city under Antigonid rule, being the main Antigonid power base in the classical Greek world. However, the crazy times of ancient Greece were not over yet. If anything, they were about to become even crazier. And once again, at the heart of all this madness would be the city of Corinth, which would play a vital role in the history to come. Following Macedonian victory over the classical Greek city-states at the Battle of Chironia, Corinth would essentially become the epicentre of Macedonian influence in the classical Greek world. Indeed, after Alexander the Great's death, Corinth remained a very important city to the Macedonians as it was their main power base in Greece. However, over the following years, this wouldn't always be the case, with the city of Corinth changing hands and playing a very important geopolitical role in the decades to come. So, following the Antigonids' assertion of dominance in mainland Macedonia and Greece, Corinth remained the epicenter of Macedonian influence. However, in 243 BC, there was finally an attempt by the classical Greeks to unify themselves into one nation. This was called the Achaean League. Now, the Achaean League was made up of Greek city-states who shared a common ancestry, as well as history. This meant a majority of the Greek classical world. So, in 243 BC, the Achaean League 
took Corinth for themselves, claiming that it was a important historical and cultural center of their history. This, to no one's surprise, angered the Antigonids and resulted in many on and off wars between the Achaean League and the Macedonians. Now, Corinth remained in the hands of the Achaean League until the Achaeans had to deal with the city of Sparta. The Spartans had never really been conquered by the Macedonians and as a result still maintained some of that arrogant Spartan pride that they had always had. So the Achaeans and Macedonians essentially joined together to deal with the Spartans and teach them a lesson. Now, as a sign of gratitude for this help, the Achaeans give Corinth back to Macedon. However, as with all things Greek, the Achaeans and the Macedonians are once again butting heads in 200 BC. This is mainly because the Antigone Macedonian king Philip V has began to assert his dominance over the Greek world a little bit too harshly for the Achaeans liking. So as a result the Achaeans look over the Mediterranean towards the city of Rome. Now Rome had just established itself as the main power in the Mediterranean as they had just defeated both Carthage, Syracuse and Macedon as Macedon had sided with Carthage during the Second Punic War. So Rome already had a foothold in the Greek world, controlling the area that was known as Epirus. So the Achaeans propose that Rome joins forces with them and together they march up into Macedon and teach Philip V a bloody lesson about interfering in Greek affairs. So Rome, never really being able to drop a grudge, agree to this plan and march out with their army as well as a few Achaeans to face Philip V in open battle. The Romans eventually bump into the Macedonian army during the foggy battle of Sinocephali and through a superior tactical command structure were able to defeat Philip V. So with Philip V defeated, Rome essentially became the most powerful player in the Greek world. Now, as mentioned before, Rome was only invited to become involved in the Greek world by the Greeks to deal with a outside power. Now the outside power was Rome and Rome was beginning to assert itself as the hegemonic leader. So in a classical Greek way of dealing with things decided that the Romans were suppressing their freedom. And the one thing the Greeks do not like is foreign powers trampling on their freedom. So in 146 BC, the Achaeans go to war with Rome. And this doesn't go well. In fact, the Achaeans get completely and utterly annihilated by Rome. So much so that Rome is able to march right into the heartland of Greece, specifically Corinth, and sack the ancient city. In fact, they not only sack it, they completely raise it to the ground. So with this, Greece is essentially under Roman command, and it's now a province of the Roman Republic. So how does Corinth come back from this? They have been completely and utterly wiped out by the Romans, and their city is non-existent. Well, it turns out that in 44 BC, whilst Julius Caesar is busy campaigning his way into the dictatorship of Rome, he actually refounds Corinth as a Roman colony. Now, this city would go on to flourish in the Roman world as the Romans began to absorb more and more Greek culture and indeed began to view the Greeks as second citizens to the Romans themselves. So as a result, the Greek world, including Corinth, Athens, Argos, Sparta, even Thebes, flourished under this new empire. 
and will continue to do so for many, many centuries to come. This was all until 267 CE, when the Goths ransacked through mainland Greece and sacked a majority of the ancient cities, including Corinth. In 396 BC, the Visigoths also sacked Corinth. However, unlike a majority of cities the Visigoths sacked, they did not completely destroy Corinth, meaning that Corinth was able to outlive the ancient age and enter into the medieval age. And so Corinth, which was the birthplace of many aspects of ancient Greek culture, survived when many aspects of the ancient world did not. Thanks for watching and listening to our video. If you like the channel, consider subscribing to Ancient History Guy. Or, if you really like the channel, head on over to our Patreon feed. There, for as little as $1 a month, you can gain access to exclusive documentaries, behind the scene footage, and videos before they're live on YouTube. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I've been the Ancient History Guy, and as always, I'll be seeing you later.